So what have we done so far? The first step uh, in dealing with natural languages is representing your data. And the data in natural languages are in the form of texts. And the texts are in the form of words and words are in the form of characters. So you can have two different models for representing your data. One is uh, character level models and the other one is uh, word level models. And what we covered so far is models for representing words. And our words could be actually a combination of a couple of words like New York Times, so it's a phrase, or uh, actually you have some words in your test data that you have never seen during your training data. And for those, a good idea is to decompose those types of words into sub words and then try to associate meaning to sub words and as a consequence to the new word that you saw. And any word that's not in your vocabulary, you're gonna represent it with unknown. So it's gonna be a special word. And that's how you're gonna deal with all of the words in your corpus. So now that you know how to represent your data, your text, it's now time to go towards applications. And the first application that we are gonna cover is text classification. And text classification, the simplest one is, uh, let's say you have an email, you receive emails, and then you want to classify your emails as, as a spammer and not a spam. So the input data is in the form of a paragraph and the output data is a spam or not a spam. So you are classifying between the two. And once you're able to do that, then you can sell your service to your customers. For instance, if you're Google or Yahoo or uh, Hotmail or whatever, you're gonna uh, sell that service to your customers as part of your uh, electronic mail service, okay? Another application is sentiment analysis. You want to know what is the dominant sentiment of a, a review for an Amazon product. So you have a bunch of examples. The input is a review, is a paragraph that somebody wrote, and the output, you know, you either have automatically generated labels from zero to five or zero and one, good and bad, or uh, it's your test data. You don't have any label for it. And then you want to predict what is the sentiment of this particular review. And that is exactly what we are going to start with. We are going to start with recursive deep models for uh, sentiment analysis. So sentiment analysis is just text classification. It's under the umbrella of text classification. I'm introducing this paper for two reasons. One is they are introducing a new data set, Stanford Sentiment Tree Bank. And this is one of the benchmarks when you want to test uh, the performance of your text classification. So whatever model that you come up with, this could be one of the benchmarks that you're gonna test your model on it. And the other reason is you're gonna hear the word recursive deep neural networks, and I don't want you to confuse it with recurrent neural networks. So they are different. So what is the objective here? Somebody gives us a piece of text, and we want to take that text and turn it into a single number, or two numbers, or five numbers, corresponding to the probabilities of uh, for instance, five different types of reviews or two different types of reviews, good and bad. Okay, so the input is a text and the output is gonna be two numbers or five numbers or five probabilities. So for this data set, Stanford Sentiment Tree Bank, you have 11,855 single sentences and these are about movie reviews. You can use a parser. So this has nothing to do with deep learning. There is a parser, you can just uh, use that. And it's gonna give you 200, uh, around 200,000 phrases, unique phrases. But why do we need a far parser? Why do we need to parse our sentences as trees? Because the structure of the recursive neural network is gonna depend on the underlying tree. So the parser is gonna do this for us. It's gonna say, you gave me a sentence, this film doesn't care about cleverness, wit, or any other kind of intelligent humor. So this is a single example out of uh, those 200,000 unique phrases, okay? So this is, a, this is an example. And then per each node, you have sentiments. It's labeled. So this has a neutral. Film is neutral. Doesn't is neutral. 
and these are the labels. Zero is for neutral, plus is for positive, double plus is for very positive, so humor is very positive, and uh, we don't have any very negative here. We have a bunch of negatives here. And in the end, the total sense of this phrase is labeled as negative in the data. So that's your data. Your data is in this form. This is your input, the tree, and the output is uh, very negative, negative, neutral, positive, very positive. And this is coming out of the parser. But once you have that, you can actually take a look at the n grams in your uh, sentences. The one grams are gonna correspond this A panel here. They are gonna correspond to these single words. This film doesn't care about, etc. So these are your words. And as you can see, if you look at only one grams, if you look at only words, then most of your words are gonna be neutral. Most of the words have a neutral sense. Some of them are somewhat negative and very few of them are negative and very little are very negative. Similarly for somewhat positive, positive and very positive. This is for when you have single words, but once you start considering pairs of words, that's gonna give you bigram, uh, you're gonna see less of neutral and more of uh, the other classes. And as you keep doing that, if you have 10 grams, 20 grams, 25 grams and above, actually 20 grams and above, then you're gonna see a more balanced distribution. So another way of looking at the same figure is the one on the right. Now we are doing cuts, 1D cuts. So there is a cut here, and then you can take a look at your histogram. Many of your words are neutral, and very few of them are gonna be very positive or very negative. As you go to 10 grams, you're gonna have a more balanced distribution. Then your distribution is gonna get more balanced. And when, when, when you go here, then it's gonna be the most balanced distribution. It turns out that you're gonna have a bimodal distribution for these. So this is just exploratory data analysis. So we are taking a look at our data and analyzing it. So the question is, are the node labels provided as ground truth or just a true structure or just a tree structure? Uh, so these nodes, they're they are being labeled. So this is part of your labeling. So there are two things that are happening in the parser. One is you have labels per each word, so this film, etc. Then you're gonna have labels for each node, and then the tree structure is also coming out of the parser. So, so like does the that phrase, does the phrase "this film" that corresponds to that parent node of neutral zero? Yes. So okay. this this film is a combination of these two, and when I say bigrams, that's part of that. Okay. Any other question? So this is exploratory data analysis. You're exploring your data, you're looking at the distribution of your data in total. You look at a single example in your data set. What is the input data? What is the output data? And once you look at your data, everything in deep learning starts with the data. Data is a source code. So once you take a look at your data, it's gonna give you an idea of what type of model you're gonna write to explain the data. Okay, it's always starting with the data and this is our data. And this is giving us a clear picture of what the data set is like. This is how many observations you have. Where is the data coming from? These are movie reviews. Here's an example. And here is the total big picture of the data set. So what are we gonna do now? We are gonna rely on the tree structure to create the recursive model. Uh, the question is the tree is automatically produced by the parser and the node sentiment is human labeled. Uh, actually, most of it is automatic. So there is a classical machine learning algorithm that's gonna give you this tree. And there is actually a paper about, or a couple of papers about that parser that I'm not going through. But for now, let's assume that you have a tree, it is labeled, it is correctly constructed, and these are your data. Your data are in this form. Does that answer your question? So under that assumption, we want to come up with a model for our data. And let's take a look at these examples. Not very good. For each one of these words, you have a label. These are neutral. Not is neutral. Very is neutral. Good is positive. And then you have a tree structure for it. And in the end, we want to combine this sentence into a single number or into five numbers or a low dimensional vector because then we can classify vectors. First thing first, 
these not very good, you can represent them by vectors. And this is exactly what we did. The Pascal plot sessions, our words are gonna be represented by vectors. And these are not one hot vectors, these are actually parameterized. So you have a parameter vector for A, B, and C, and let's say they have size 100 or 256. Okay, that's what you choose. And it's, a, it's not a sparse vector, it's full and the values are from negative infinity to positive infinity. Now the question is how are you gonna combine and come up with the node here? First of all, you're gonna represent your words with a word embedding matrix. So that's why word embeddings were crucial. It is the first step in natural language processing. And that's why we spent a lot of time on representing words. And the words in our dictionary are gonna be D-dimensional, D is a choice that you make, it's a hyperparameter, and you have this many words in your vocabulary. So you can represent the entire thing by a matrix. So this is your dictionary now. And A is a column in this dictionary. B is another column, C is another column. So you just read them off. Now what we are gonna do is gonna, we need to know what is the probability of uh, the label being neutral or the label being neutral or the label being positive and uh, the other cases. To turn a vector, for instance, A, we want to turn it into a vector. We want to turn it into a probability. We are gonna multiply it by a matrix. So A is D-dimensional. Once you multiply it by a matrix, let's say this is five by A-dimensional, the end product is gonna be a vector that is five-dimensional, okay? But the problem is that that's, Vector is in real line, real line, it's not a probability. To turn it into a probability, you do a softmax. So it's gonna give you a probability distribution now. Why A is a probability distribution. And now you can increase the probability of the correct class. So now you're classifying your words. Per each leaf uh, in your tree, you're doing a classification. And as I said, WS is five by D. So it's gonna take a D dimensional vector and it's gonna make it five dimensional because you have five classes. You're gonna do the same thing for vectors B and C. So you're gonna multiply that by a matrix. You're gonna multiply this by a matrix and then that's gonna turn into probabilities after the softmax. So far so good. We took care of the words in our vocabulary or at least in this sentence. Now we want to come up with these functions G of B and C and G of A and P1. And P1 is just what you're gonna put here. And that's where the recursive, recursive uh, neural network is gonna come into picture. Your model could be very simple. You can take two vectors, B and C, and you can concatenate them together. It's gonna give you a new vector. It's gonna have dimension uh, 2D. So the dimension is two times D. You can multiply that by a, by a matrix. You can apply a nonlinearity on it. Otherwise your model is gonna be linear and boring. So you apply a nonlinearity, and then that's gonna give you a new vector, P1. You can do the same thing for P2. Once you know P1, you can concatenate, concatenate it with A, multiply it by a matrix, apply a nonlinearity, and get a new vector. F could be as simple as tan H, tangent hyperbolic function. So that's your activation function. So now you're starting to see neural networks. So far, you didn't see any nonlinearities in our word representations. Now you're starting to see them. So that's your nonlinearity. And what is W? We know that the input has a size of 2D. It's a vector that is 2D dimensional. And in the end, you're interested in, in coming up with a vector that is D dimensional. So you're multiplying it by a matrix of proper size. And once you have P1 and P2, the rest of it is the same. Then P1 is similar to A, B, C, and then you can do a softmax on it. And then it's gonna give you a probability. Once you have P2, you multiply it by a matrix of this size, and then that's gonna give you the corresponding probability after the softmax. Now that you have probabilities, you can write down your loss function and maximize your likelihood or minimize your loss function. The problem with this model is that uh, these words are not interacting. So it's just a linear combination of these two, and there is no pairwise interaction between B and C. And it turns out that this model is not gonna give you good performance. It's gonna give you okay performance. There is a paper after that that said, uh, maybe the problem is that we need more parameters. 
So not only we are going to have vector representations for each word, we are going to have matrix representation for each word. So not only you have a vector representation, you have a matrix representation. And these are the parameters of your model, by the way. A, capital A, B, capital B, C, capital C, etc. And WS and W are the parameters of your model. Now you are parameterizing it heavily per each word and per each node. You have matrix uh, representations in addition to vector representations. But once you have that, if you want to know P1, the value of P1, you can say C is going to interact with B. So you're going to multiply it C times B. And then capital B is going to interact with C. That's how you're going to get the interaction between the two terms. And the rest of it is the same as before. Now you have a vector that is 2D dimensional. You're going to multiply it by W, and that's going to give you P1. Now you're going to have a corresponding big matrix that's going to give you matrices in the end. So can somebody tell me what's the problem with this model? So this, the first model was not performing good in practice because you didn't have interactions. What is the problem with this model? Seems like it would require like an exponentially bigger data set. And we don't, with 12,000 sentences, we don't really have that much data. Uh, that's a fair point. So if I rephrase your answer, you are telling, ma- telling me that you have a lot of parameters. Yeah. Yeah. So They're for each underfit. Yes. So for each word, you have a lot of parameters. So it's a memory expensive method. That's one problem. And the other problem is what you're mentioning. This is not enough data to train that many parameters. It might end up overfitting, et cetera. So to deal with that, all we needed was pairwise interaction. That was what was missing from this model. And that's exactly what recursive neural tensor networks is going to do. And that's the method introduced by this paper. Okay. So what is that? In the end, we need to have, forget about this part for now, because this is a tensor, you might get confused. So don't worry about that part. Let's focus on this part, because we know matrices and we know scalars. If you want to have the pairwise interaction between B and C, you can just form a dot product between the two. So this is going to be a dot product of this vector BC and BC. But then you can change your dot product by putting a matrix in between. So once you do that, this is a 2 by 2D by 2D matrix. These are parameters of your model. Once you do that multiplication, that's going to give you a single scalar, H, H, I. But then the problem is we need vectors in the end. So you need to have a vector that is D-dimensional. So you're going to repeat that D times to give you a vector. It is very similar to multi-head attention that we are going to cover later on. Okay. So now you're going to have D of those. And once you have D, this is now a vector that is D-dimensional. And a tensor is just a generalization of a matrix. So it's going to be 2D by 2D by D-dimensional. And in the end, what's going to happen is for each of these entries, you're going to do that multiplication. So you're going to have a for loop on D. So each, each of the VIs gives us one of the weighting matrices for one of the entries of H. And then we have exactly. D. We have D of them. Okay. Exactly. So now what did we do? This is the previous model, recursive neural network, had W times BC in it. We still have that. So it's a generalization of the previous model. If you set V to be zero, or if your optimization decides to set V to be zero, you're not losing much. You're going back to the original model that you started with. But the other cool thing is, now you have the pairwise interaction between words B and C through this dot product and through this uh, uh, tensor. And that's why it's called a tensor network because V is a tensor. So what else do we gain? Now V is independent of the size of your vocabulary. So this is always going to be the dimension 2D by 2D by D. And D is something that you choose. So you have full control over the choice of D. Okay, so now V is independent of the size of your vocabulary or is independent of the structure of your tree. And this is going to give you less parameters. And it still gives you the interaction, pairwise interaction between the words. You do the same thing for P2 after applying a nonlinearity on that operation. So you get P1, you put it here, and the rest of it is the same as before. Now the question is, what is your loss function? You have five labels. 
you have very negative, negative, neutral, positive, very positive. And let's say this is one, two, three, four, five. What this last function is gonna do is gonna look at the output of this softmax. It's gonna have a, it's gonna give you five probabilities and let's call them P1, P2, P3, P4, P5. If the underlying ground truth, if the underlying label for a node, in this case, it is the third node. So you're gonna increase the probability of the third node. So you're gonna increase P3. So this is exactly what this last function is doing. So it's gonna pick out the corresponding probability. And then the next term is just to regularize it for your model not to overfit. And what is theta? Theta are V, W, V, S, and L. So your L, you can actually initialize it to your word vectors that we learned how to do it. It could be word to vec or glove, uh, or you can initialize it randomly and let your neural network learn it. If you have enough data, you can actually learn them. So you learn L, you learn W, S, you learn W, and you learn V through this objective function. And this objective function is the cross entropy loss. And in fact, these T's are one hot vectors. If the ground truth is, let's say the third entry, if the ground truth is neutral, so your label is gonna be three, equivalently, you can have a vector that is five dimensional with dimensions one, two, four, and five being zero and dimension three being one. Once you multiply that vector by a vector of the same size, it's gonna pick out the corresponding probability, okay? So it's gonna pick out the corresponding uh, y, and then you are maximizing that. Is the superscript i, that's just an index, that's not being like raised to a certain power, right? No, it's just an index. Okay. And that's exactly what you're asking. What is yi? Yi is a c dimensional vector, and c is the number of classes, in our case it's five, and t, is a target distribution. And the target distribution are those one hot vectors. That one is also five by one dimensional. And this is just saying that you're doing the dot product of, of the two. If you have a vector that is zero, zero, one, zero, zero, and then you multiply it by another vector, it's gonna pick out that entry, the third entry. And this is the jth entry, okay? So if, is everything clear now? Any questions? And the range on J is E? It's going to be 5, or it's going to be C. OK. So Y, J, I is the entry J of this vector, or the J entry of this vector. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. A quick question. So for um, like in the exam, so you say, so we have F is the hyperbolic tangent. And that's going to be applied to every element, not because that's because these are vector, or these are the P1s and P2s are going to be uh, matrices, right? So P1 and P2 are vectors. Oh, they're ve okay, but they're vectors, but when we apply F to those, where that's going to be, that's where we're applying that coordinate wise. Um, exactly, yes. So that's a very good point. And whenever in deep learning, you're gonna do point wise operations a lot, okay? And in Python, you're gonna actually do point wise operation a lot and that's called broadcasting. So you're gonna apply tan H or on every single entry of your vectors. So you should get to get used to it right now. So it's gonna make your life much easier. In deep learning, we are gonna do a lot of pointwise operations. So if an operation, if I write an operation or if you read an operation in any papers, that is gonna be pointwise or element wise, unless otherwise stated. So the default in your minds should be that this is point-wise. So does that answer your question? Yeah, that answers it. Thanks. And any other questions? Uh, how do we represent the target distribution? Is it going to be like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4? The target distribution, you mean this? These are one hot vectors. So it's going to be a vector. You can think of them as Dirac distributions, Dirac delta. Okay, It is 1 at the correct label and zeros at the incorrect labels. For instance, here, it is a one at the neutral position, at the third position, and zeros everywhere else. So that's what TI is representing. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah. Any other questions? I'm a little confused with uh, what was the algorithm in matrix vector recursive NN. So could you just explain that a little? Uh, which one? Can you say it again? The second one, the matrix vector recursive NN. 
Oh yeah, so the matrix vector recursive NN, it is very similar to recursive NN, but what is the difference? Now you have more parameters per each word and per each node in your tree, you're gonna have a matrix to represent your words. So not only you have a small B, you're gonna have capital B. Not only you have a small C, you're gonna have capital C. And these are the parameters of your model. And how do you come up with the interaction between words? You take C, you multiply it by B. You take capital B, you multiply it by C. That's gonna give you two vectors. You concatenate them, and then you multiply that by a matrix. Once you have a vector, it is very similar to before. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah. What is the difference between this uh, W subscript capital M and uh, the W? Uh, so you can think of it this way. What is the size of B, capital B? Uh, size of capital B is uh, D, like the number of dimensions so of the embedding. The size of small B is D by one. The size of capital B is D by D and the size of capital C is D by D. So this vector, you can vectorize that, you can mm -hmm. flatten it, and then that's gonna be 2D squared. Mm -hmm. And the size of this WM is gonna be D squared by 2D squared. And that's gonna give you a D by D matrix in the end. So it's a lot of parameters, okay? Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, in that case, let's move on.